so good to be with you on this Leadership Sunday. If you didn't know, uh, yesterday, um, your elected leaders of all the boards and initiatives and task force and the deacons, we all gathered for a morning of meetings and workshops in our annual Leadership Day gathering. And I'm still having fun because of it. Because any time you can get leaders to come out on Saturday mornings, now we feed them, but of all the places that I have served, I still am so impressed that we can get the vast majority of our elected leaders together to talk about how we are going to serve better, to improve our ability to serve this community and the wider community. And it is so inspiring. And one thing you missed, and I, so, I sure hate you missed it, uh, we sang the song, Lead With Love. And it got so good that yeah, they start clapping in the middle of the song. So you know we had a very good time indeed. And I'm so, I hope you got a chance to walk through Jones Commons uh, to see uh, some of the work that our, our boards and committees and, and initiatives and task force are doing. And, and if you haven't found a way to connect with them or to volunteer with them, uh, there's still time to do that because I know uh, that there is more room and more opportunities for you, should you wish. Uh, it also got me to thinking about community, community, our community in particular, but the idea of community uh, in general. And it was fortunate that on Leadership Sunday, the lectionary had a series of readings that uh, really did bring us into reflection on community. And so, I witnessed yesterday the power and promise of Plymouth's community. Uh, and it was a great opportunity to go to uh, the biblical witness in which uh, the Apostle James offers wisdom uh, that I think uh, will serve us well. And I want you to uh, reflect and read with me the words of the Apostle James in his letter to all of the churches. Are any among you suffering? They should pray. Are any cheerful? They should sing songs of praise. Are any among you sick? They should call for the elders of the church and have them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise them up and anyone who has committed sins will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human like us, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then Elijah prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth yielded its harvest. My sisters and brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth, and is brought back by another, you should know that whoever brings back one who has been estranged will save the sinner's soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Will you pray with me? Gracious and merciful one, thank you. Thank you for this moment, this preaching moment, this worship celebration. Thank you for this opportunity. Hallow this moment. Make it your own. Use this weak vessel, these lips of clay to say life-giving things to your people. 
that they might be transformed in its hearing. In the words of my mouth and the meditation of every heart gathered in hearing, we pray. Amen. A few years ago, there was renewed interest in and attention paid to community organizing. And you might remember when that conversation got heated up again in the, in the early 2000s. And most agreed that there was nothing new about community organizing as any uh, look at history, looking at historical change and, and movements, all of those things relied on organizing communities of people to affect social change. However, the discussions about community organizing in our current time reminds us that communities have been organizing to influence policy, culture, and the economy for a long time, engaging and using and organizing the time, talent, and, and money of people of local communities to do it. And churches too, churches too have understood that people of faith needed to be organized sometimes and empowered to bring to bear the values and commitments of religious and spiritual traditions in making social change. And so you can remember during the civil rights movement in the United States and the fight against apartheid in South Africa, we see church communities organizing against powerful institutions bent on maintaining the status quo of oppression. Oh, but we, we see the working of communities all around us. It's going to happen in, in places of crisis around the world, in Ukraine, in Gaza, here at home in Springfield, Ohio, on the East Coast in the aftermath of the hurricane. Communities will harness their power. They will come together to provide help and support for those suffering. Communities will tap into their power and their promise to offer some measure of support for those in very deep need. And underlying the role and purpose of community organizing is the idea that ordinary people outside of government and business, outside of the officially established organized power of the state or of a corporate entity, ordinary people could be empowered to play a more significant role in decision-making and social change. And so, as you can see, there is power and promise in community. That communities that are as embodied in collective expressions of connection and collaboration and a will to do good things are meaningful. But that Conclusion about communities, about the power and promise of community, begs a different question regarding the beloved community of God. What happens to a community's power and promise when love, when God, when, when justice, when prayer, when forgiveness when, or radical hospitality, when these are the organizing principles of an assembly. How much more are we empowered to do and be community? When we move beyond the transactional, the transactional language of business and, and politics to organize ourselves in service to God's beloved, in service to doing justice, in service to building the reign of God. And what kinds of themes, messages, and ideas can the gathered community of God's people offer a world that has lost how to speak and respond with kindness, hospitality, and justice. The Apostle Paul was arguably the first to try to articulate the meaning of that kind of community, the meaning of a community of God's people. 
It was Paul who appropriated the word ecclesia to mean church. You see, Paul appropriated the word from what was going on around him. He knew that the ecclesia described a public assembly of citizens who gathered in the public square to discuss civic and business affairs. But oh, the one who encountered Jesus, the one who encountered Jesus thought there's something different about the assembly of people called by God or gathered in God's name, a fellowship of those who heard the good news of Jesus Christ and sought to live in a way that reflected the reign of God. That kind of community, what much more power could they have? And so we hear the apostles speaking over and over again about this community being the body of Christ, whose power and promise are found in the work of faith, the labor of love, the, the steadfastness of hope. This ecclesia, this church, an embodied and spiritual people coming together in prayer, in covenant has the potential to be far more powerful than any other organization, any other assembly debating in the public square on civic affairs. So by the time James comes along, James, identified as Jesus' brother, and boy, when you read enough history and biblical scholars, I just hope it was Jesus' brother. But James is the one who comes along and writes this letter, not to any particular church, but to any gathered body, any body of Christ that gathers in the name of God. He, he dresses this letter to all, he circulates this letter, and he wants them to understand the role and purpose of this assembly in God's work in the world. James can lay out the ethical and practical implications of the gathered community of God, an assembly of people, a faithful people who can communicate with God, be in relationship with God for healing, for forgiveness and reconciliation. So if there is any suffering, this community addresses it First, through prayer. If there is joy, this community responds to it in prayer and praise. If there is any who is missing the mark, if there is a breach or any estrangement among the people, this community prays itself back into relationship. Prays itself back into hope. What, what, what power and promise of a community that can do that? And unlike all the other organizations a person might join, the church makes possible the opportunity for healing, for energizing, a life-giving way of being, especially when we are at our most weakest, when we're at our weakest, our most estranged, our most aggrieved, our most isolated, our most in need. Prayer, prayer becomes the way we begin to work it out. Work it out, working out an ethic of care, a ministry of radical involvement, so expansive and so inclusive that anybody could bring anything and know that they will be held by the community of God. You didn't even say anything. That anybody knows. They can bring whatever is going on. They can bring their suffering. They can bring their troubles. They can bring their joys. They can bring their sicknesses to this community. And as James says confidently, the prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. That's the community I want to go to. That's the one I want to take my suffering to. Now, I don't believe for one minute that James thought that every prayer the church uttered would be answered in the way we wanted it to. I'm not telling anybody that prayers will cure diseases or affect otherworldly miracles, but I do believe, and I believe that James believed, and I believe that Paul knew that a praying church 
becomes how we can empower people individually and communally to be the source of God's liberating, inspiring, encouraging, and forgiving presence that we can offer a liberating and inspiring, encouraging, a forgiving experience for others who need community. I've experienced the the language of prayer can shift the environment from one where we are expected to bear our burdens and suffering alone to where we see our congregation as a source of inspiration and encouragement. I have seen prayer shift the the environment from an individualistic do-it-along culture to a communal relationship of sharing and support. I've seen it. I've seen it here at Plymouth. I'm talking about a prayer that embraces us, embraces everything we bring, and empower us to to live and thrive against the odds. Prayer strengthens us. Prayer facilitates thanksgiving. Our prayers respond to physical and spiritual matters in our lives. Our prayers affirm forgiveness. It is our way of responding and reclaiming all who feel separated from God and from each other through prayer. Our possibilities are expanded and our power magnified. That is the power and promise of God's gathered community. Now I have also seen how the power and promise of community, of beloved community, of God's community can be forfeited. I've seen what happens when people do not experience church as a source of healing, forgiveness, and reconciliation. I've seen it. It's been said to me in moments of pastoral care, moments of prayer, church has not been the source of healing and forgiveness. Reconciliation. I saw it at the rallies and protests and marches in the aftermath of the police killing of Jamar Clark and, 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 and George Floyd. When, when a group of clergy and people of faith sought to hold space for prayer, some young people at these protests found our prayers futile, irrelevant, and ineffective. They did not trust the words of prayer. They did not trust the church. They did not see the power and promise of our community. They did not see prayers affecting change on the ground. They did not see us there before. In the classes that I teach at United Seminary, I'm getting more and more students every year with stories of trauma and church hurt. And I even wonder, then why are you at seminary? Because regardless of communities that did not provide them places for healing and forgiveness and reconciliation, they still were looking for meaning. They were still looking to experience the power and promise of beloved community. They, they offered harrowing testimonies about churches that were just anything but healing and forgiving and reconciling paces. And so perhaps in everything we do, every choice we make, every decision we undertake, it begins with the essential practice of prayer. The intentional hallowing of space and place for people to experience the healing presence of community. I was telling someone from the earlier service that when I was a kid, I used to always say, why do these people pray for everything we do? We go to the church picnic. We start with praying. You go out for the, to, 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 to volunteer, to, to take out, to feed people. We start with prayer. Everything starts with prayer. Every time you turn around, before the church ever move, we pray. And as I got older, I understood. I understood. They were tapping into the power and promise of God's gathered people. No, one specific prayer may not be answered. But that we gather together in relationship, in community, we were providing a healing space, a forgiving space, a reconciling space so that we can go out and serve God's people. 
since the COVID pandemic, new thinking, new thinking has arisen about the power and promise of community. I have never seen so many scholars and thinkers who never once talked about church starting to talk about how churches may be the last institution the last institute, the church is the last institution capable of combating loneliness and hyper individualism. And oh, tell you, I had fun reading that word, hyper individualism. But new thinking, new understanding that maybe, maybe we looked away too soon. Maybe we, we got too secular too fast. Maybe we missed what these communities can do. Church is the one of the, is one of the last institution that offers a shared space for people together at an appointed day and an appointed time every week. We don't have to send out a Google uh, hole for you to figure out when to come to church. We're going to be here. One of the last ones. And so we dare not miss that opportunity to form and practice community, to bring healing and forgiveness and reconciliation. We dare not close our doors to that cry for community. And so for a praying community, a community steadfast and covenant with God and each other because God is present and moving, a community that has seen how God's mercy and compassion transformed us personally and communally, so much is possible. And oh, we are a praying community, a praying community that has endured the slings and arrows of division and radicalization, sickness and suffering, separation and disconnection. Oh, but we continue to hang on in there. No, prayer may not assure healing, and it most certainly may not be the source of any cure of any particular thing, but it may be the only opportunity we have to provide a place and a moment for a healing space, for connection and reconciliation, for setting the stage for a practice of community such that the welfare and well-being of any who dare cross these doors will be secured. And these are not abstract concepts, but the very fabric of a community of God. That, that is what, it, it is what makes us who we are. It is what makes communities so effective and powerful. When the focus is on healing and forgiveness and reconciliation, we create a space where everyone is valued and accepted and where the power of community is truly realized. So... I saw it yesterday in Leadership Day, where we were demonstrating the power and promise of community. Never forget it. Never take it for granted. Never take the power of prayer for granted. Never take the, the, our identity as a praying community for granted. I know we are a praying community because I've heard the testimonies so many of you who say over and over again, I found a life-giving space here. I found healing and forgiveness here. I've found my place here. And so whatever else we may do, whatever else we may hope to accomplish, whatever stands before us in our future, I pray, I pray, I pray, that we never stop, never, ever stop, never give it up, never, ever stop being a place, a praying place that makes available healing, forgiveness, and reconciliation because so many out there need it and will come hoping that we would be the community that gives it. I pray that we continue to do it. May it always, always be so. Amen.